it's Monday. Welcome to the last day of the month of May 2021. And this is our final edition of the show, Frontier Opening Bell, for the uh, month May 2020, May 2021, actually. I'm Temple Ashadu. Let's look at the markets, numbers, uh, weekly status, and a couple of uh, last trading sessions for some of them, where we've got the Nigerian Stock Exchange uh, down by 0.18% on a week-to-date basis. The BRVM Stock Exchange Friday specifically was down, lowered uh, by some 48 business points. The Egyptian Stock Exchange was positive, 58 business points. That was yesterday. Sunday when it actually still traded. Nairobi Stock Exchange jumped. That was a huge one. 4.18% on a week-to-date basis. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange uh, almost touching the 1%, but it was just 92 business, 92 business points uh, appreciation as at Thursday. East African markets headlines now where you have foreign banks volume of business in Kenya dipping to $3.42 billion. Uh, that's for 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, just imagine there. Uh, Kenya Central Bank uh, accepts uh, 20.58 billion um, shillings uh, in weekly TBS auction. Stanchart Kenya is to upgrade its ATMs to accept check deposits. Housing finance reports loss of 191.8 million shillings in the first quarter of 2021. In Ethiopia, IFAD, EU, to inject 26.5 million euros debt relief in rural financial institutions. Merge exchange lists Springsteen 300B East Windsor NG Limited on its main board. Ali, welcome to a beautiful week. Uh, let's start with getting some analysis about all of these headlines from you and possibly give us the backstory to that surge of 4.1 its week to date gains in Kenya, the markets. Yes, uh, thank you, Temple. Let me start with that uh, surge uh, at the NSC. Uh, just to, uh, to show you, the NSC, 60, 62% of the NSC is about Safaricom. Uh, then uh, the, the large balance is the bank stock. So it's really a telecom and banking uh, index, if you think about it, um, with the telecom side uh, outweighing all the rest. So this uh, reaction in, at the beginning of the week, there was a surge in Safaricom's uh, price on the news that Safaricom's license application had gone through in Ethiopia. Um, as I said earlier in the week, I thought it was a bit of a sugar high. Uh, market was overreacting to the upside. I think, um, uh, you know, everyone looked at the market opportunity, 110 million. But, you know, there have been significant developments with regard to Ethiopia. The Americans, for example, um, have sanctioned a number of officials. They are now trying to persuade the World Bank and the IMF and other multilaterals to soft pedal on, uh, uh, on loans to Ethiopia unless um, they are humanitarian. So we've got quite a volatile picture, but I think shareholders essentially are looking at the, the big opportunity. It's a blue sky opportunity. The challenge for Safaricom is how quickly they'll get the mobile money license um, because that's going to be a key part of their profitability. So we had that Safaricom surge taking the market up and then we had very positive banking stocks, uh, particularly Equity Bank um, uh, pushing the market higher as well. Equity Bank is the biggest bank by assets since uh, the acquisitions in Congo. Dr. Mwangi uh, reported first quarter results way ahead of expectations and painted a very bright picture. They skipped the dividend last year, but uh, essentially investors are looking through that. So really a story of telecom and banks uh, driving the Nairobi Stock Exchange higher. I think the telco rally has run out of steam. Um, I think the banks have probably got more to go. Um, but you've got a stock pick, uh, uh, and, and for example, equity, ABSA, Standard Chartered, for various reasons, look very attractively priced to me. Um, foreign banks, volume of business in Kenya dipping. Look, this has been a trend, actually, for quite a long time. Um, uh, I, I take it back to the late 90s, when uh, a lot of the foreign banks, the likes of Barclays, etc., retreated from the rural areas, saying it was too expensive to deliver banking services, cost of the branch, etc. 
And we had the likes of Equity Bank, which was then a very small building society, step into the breach um, and basically look to bank uh, all these folks. And uh, then we've moved over time to the digitization trend. It's become much cheaper to reach people off the phone. And essentially, our domestic indigenous banks are really dominating the scene. Um, and that trend started about 20 years ago and has accelerated um, in the last few years as well. Kenya Central Bank accepting 20 billion shillings of uh, T-bills, a lot of liquidity in the T-bill market, quite well priced. Uh, One-year T-bills have got a nine-handle. Uh, banks are pretty keen on that for now. Uh, okay, we've had a little bit of an inflation push higher, but uh, I don't see the Central Bank moving off 7% for a while. Standard Chartered, uh, tough year last year for them. Share price looks pretty reasonable. Um, but essentially closing down branches, moving forward uh, with the digitization program. They've got a very interesting mobile uh, application, and now they've uh, been authorized to make mobile phone-based loans. So you can see they're also targeting the mass market there. Housing finance uh, loss. Look, it's been a tough time for housing finance for quite a few years. Um, uh, it, private equity has moved in. Uh, into Britam. Britam is the main shareholder in housing finance. We should see some corporate activity. I think it's up for sale. Uh, Ethiopia, if at EU, to inject 26.5 million euros debt relief. The real story in Ethiopia is how they've burnt the bridges with the US and with the European partners. And the question is, how bad is that squeeze going to turn out? This weekend, we had some uh, 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 protests in the capital of Addis. Um, this was really, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to call it, but basically the government busted a bunch of people, gave them photographs of Putin and Xi Jinping. I mean, this is a comedy in terms of how to conduct foreign relations. It, it's really quite shocking. And it, it's, it's even more alarming. I've been reading some of the language that's coming out of the Ethiopian government. I mean, these guys have got to get serious and, and they've got to deal with the situation and with their partners as, uh, as required. They can't keep spitting this ridiculous PR story. There's a genocide going on. Everyone can see it. It's leaking out left, right and center. There's no way you can spin it any differently. And I think that's a very big risk right now in the Horn of Africa. And added to that is the heavy weight of uh, farming in those regions at this point as well. Thanks a great deal, Ali. Uh, both in any quick additions there. I think your audio is muted, Bosin. Sorry, my apologies. The, I was talking about the OECD story, and I just came in within the last hour. The organization of uh, 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 um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that's the OECD, released its uh, global forecast for 2021 from raises to 5.8% from 5.6% previous. That's just what is breaking right now. Thank you so much. All right, and Bosa, I appreciate that notice. Thanks a great deal. Western African markets and, of course, that of Nigeria at the moment, where uh, Ghana's Monetary Policy Committee meeting is expected to hold at 11 a.m. today. FMDQ uh, platform admits 200 million naira of uh, Trust Bank Holdings Limited commercial paper. Honeywell Flowers profit rises 73% to 1.12 billion naira in the first half of 2021. In Côte d'Ivoire, Bank Atlantic declared a 26 billion sefa franc profit for 2020 financial year. Morocco's Amin El Kanegi is the new chief executive officer of Alliance Senegal. Uh, the, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo is to receive some $1.5 billion IMF package to fund the three year program. Uh, Chimba Okadeke, I know that at uh, Vetiver Capital Management, you cover uh, the Ghanaian markets uh, amply. Uh, can you talk us through uh, basically some kind of an outlook that you have on the markets, uh, knowing that the MPC is holding? this morning. Uh, thank you, Tempo. So for the Ghanaian um, MPC meeting that we're expecting today, we know what we know is that the um, committee has held rates, the monetary policy rate conference for six um, consecutive sessions. And the reason has been that um, 
uh, although inflation had been rising at that time, they were expecting that by Q2, where we are now, we should see inflation um, dropping. They should see inflation dropping um, to within the um, acceptable range that the CB, that the bank, um, you know, has is targeting, which is about six to ten percent. So, um, according to the inflation numbers for April, we can see that that number has dropped um, significantly from about thirteen point five percent to. I think 8.3 or 8.5 percent, if I'm not mistaken. So that is well within the range um, that the bank has been targeted, which is um, very um, positive for the for the country. And if you compare that to the rate, comparing 6. Point, I'm sorry, 8.5 percent to the 14.5 percent, that is the MBR rate. Um, when you look at your inflation adjusted returns, investors should be happy about that because it's a lot more than we can see for Nigeria currently at the moment with inflation around 18% levels and our rates um, around 11.5 um, and thereabouts. So for, for the outlook for the MPC meeting, um, what we see or what I think will happen, uh, we have been seeing a lot of countries favor an expansionary um, policy stance. Um, and so I think that given where inflation stands currently and the bank's initial decision to hold even when inflation was trending upwards. Now that they're at a favorable position, we should or we may see them um, reduce rates a bit. We may see them um, reduce rates favorably because they're trying to favor an expansionary stance. Um, but it remains to be seen what the bank or what the committee would decide. Um, and of course, we'll be able to get there reason. But for us, I, I think um, that we'll be seeing the bank reduce um, rates, maybe slightly, but just, and, and it will just be due to the inflationary um, pressures reducing. Um, so I can also talk about the Honeywell, Honeywell flower profit. Yeah. We can see that their um, profit rose 73%. Overall, I think it was a very, um, I think, impressive result, a good result if you look at their, um, their performance from top line to bottom line. We saw, we saw that revenue increased um, by about, uh, I think 36%, if I'm also not mistaken. And we saw that um, profit also increased by 73% year on year. Um, so looking at the past year for many of these companies, Honeywell Flower it was a flower company. Um, and we can see that for many other flower companies like flower mills, for example, we saw that 2020 was a very um, profitable year for them. Even with the pandemic, we saw them, you know, recognizing increased revenues and profits due to the closure of the borders, which limited um, inflow, the influx of um, imported flour and flour products. Um, so that has, you know, helped the company, that helped the company in that period. And the outlook still remains strong for the company Given that, um, given that we should see um, demand remain strong for, for flour and flour-related products. However, one um, problem or one challenge that the company has faced in recent times um, is in relation to its debt. Uh, we know that the company, I think, um, has, uh, has taken borrowings from some banks, which in, and some of them include um, First Bank of Nigeria, and around I think April, the CBN gave it an ultimatum. I think it put it our ultimatum to, um, you know, refinance it debt or to repay the loan. So the company has been out in the market looking for, you know, a way to refinance, um, probably to, um, through commercial papers or most likely through commercial papers. So that is one thing we see in the company's future. It will definitely get a commercial paper or a bond, depending on its strategy, long term or short term, to refinance this debt. And for investors, what they'll be looking at will be their, um, the company's cash flows, which I think has gotten stronger. If you look at cash flow from operations, it has increased from 5 billion to um, 12 billion, according to the recently released FY21 results. Um, and so that's Although it may not be um, enough to support the um, current uh, about 31 billion current loans that the company has at the moment, um, we think that they can spread out um, their offerings and they should be able to you know work out a program that can sufficiently cover this loan. 
One other um, disadvantage that we see um, probably is the timing of this um, commercial paper issuance. If it had come into the market last year, then all well and good, very favorable because rates were very low. But now rates are on the rise. Um, I doubt we can get away with the low rate offering at this at this time. Investors will really be looking um, for higher rates at the moment. So that's the only negative we see. We see that it might affect its finance costs in the year. I think that's it for the Nigerian or West African markets from here. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thanks a great deal. Uh, both saying, we know that there's been a shortage of uh, COVID-19 vaccines across major parts of Africa. Uh, do you expect that to impact the uh, decision of the MPC at, at, in Ghana today? I don't, say, I don't really think that much. Uh, well, if you look at the news you're getting about the pandemic, the virus and the vaccine is coming more from South Africa. President Ramaphosa is, 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 is getting it all up here. The business liquidation stories coming out of South Africa has written about 55%. In terms of liquidations coming through from last year, small, medium-sized businesses, according to reports we got late last week. So South Africa is where the, 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 the epicenter is, in the manner of speaking. The Ghanaians are moving forward in terms of uh, uh, economic positioning for themselves, of themselves for the intra-Africa trade, in terms of uh, startups as well, and all of that. So I think the monetary policy will focus a little bit more in Ghana on uh, balancing its fiscal uh, position, as it were, uh, and then try to uh, manage also the relationship with external multilateral agencies such as the World Bank and, and the IMF. Well, but on a final note, to speak to the DRC, uh, Congo DRC getting 1.5 billion US dollars from the IMF. I think that's one big story. After about nine years of hiatus, they're now coming back to to the IMF and getting the 1.5 billion. I think this, I think it's some good money on the table that the DRC should use very uh, very well. You know the whole equity bank. Uh, Nigeria's access bank in Congo DRC. It looks like the Congo DRC is beginning to turn itself around. Like I always say here on the show, keep one eye on your neighbors. Many thanks, Bolson. Southern African headlines. We are South Africa's breweries, Zenzele Kabili, lists on the uh, empowerment segments of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Visual International Holdings uh, plans to buy Agility South Africa via share for share. African equities revenue is down by 27.44%. Growth Point Properties makes cash offer to buy Global Wealth Limited. Saudi's ACWA Power is eyeing South Africa's next green electricity auction. Ali, let's bring these headlines to you for quick understanding. Yes, can I just quickly add to what uh, Burson was saying about the Congo and, and second what he was saying. I mean, clearly, uh, President Shishikedi is a man to watch because, uh, you know, the IMF writing a ticket for 1.5 billion is significant. And not only that, we've seen uh, his ability uh, to triangulate the existing players, which are in some ways Uganda and Rwanda. He's, ex he's widened it out. He's gotten you guys excited. He's got Kenya very interested. He's talking about joining the EAC. So definitely, from my point of view, he is a man to watch. And I think, you know, Congo has a lot of potential. We tend to always look at the commodities, cobalt and copper, but we don't look at the population. Because remember, it's all divisible by the number of citizens you have. And a country like Botswana is infinitely richer, notwithstanding it's got less resources than somewhere like DR Congo because of the population. But he is a man to watch, I've I got I to say. I agree with you, Ali, if your tempo allows me to very quickly I touch on the, the Congo DRC has spent the last two years devoting the bigger chunk of his annual budget to agriculture. So like Ali says, folks, we tend to just think about uh, Congo by copper and other things. Look, they're turning the corner. The uh, President Shekedi is really turning the corner. They're doing 60, almost 70 percent of annual budget now into agriculture and agro allies. That's interesting. Yeah, so definitely, I, I, I agree with Buss on that. Uh, just quickly go to your South African headlines. Let me start with number three, African equity revenues uh, down 27.44%. Uh, and I think um, basically, if you look at uh, uh, that, that sort of business, it's been a tough year last year. Um, you had to make more investments rather than uh, uh, harvest. So I think you know, you'll see that trend in a number of cases. I mean, the key, key issue for me in South Africa really is this third wave. Uh, you know, how bad will it be? 
Ramaphosa yesterday spoke to the nation. He's, he's like tinkered with the um, restrictions. But really, it will depend on whether it transpires to be worse or less worse than the previous two waves. Northern Cape at the moment, for example, is worse than in the previous two waves. Uh, uh, Halten province is being badly affected. That's the engine of South Africa. That's where Johannesburg is. So a lot will depend on that. And remember last year, really not the economy for six. Thank you very much. Thanks a great deal, Ali. Uh, let's move to the northern part of Africa. Uh, of course, you have uh, Sudan saying it is ready and open for business. Egypt's uh, central bank issues treasury bills worth 18.5 billion Egyptian pounds. United Media Services is to list 20 to 30 percent stake on the Egyptian stock exchange by 2024. CFG Bank's uh, NBI rises by 93% to 74 million dirhams in the first quarter of the year 2020, 2021. Uh, Salafin Group is to pay 162.5 million dirhams dividends to shareholders. Overall, incorporation of uh, incorporated of listed Tunisian banks um, rose to 1.29 billion dinars in the first quarter quarter of the year. Uh, your thoughts first, uh, Ali, and then uh, Bosin, and possibly addition from Chima. So, so let me just go with the Sudan, Sudan story. I mean, that they're open for business. Um, I saw a number of very interesting headlines over the weekend. Uh, the uh, French finance minister said, we're taking care of the debt problem in Sudan. It's now time for businesses to go into Sudan. So I think there's a very big commitment by uh, international stakeholders to uh, ease this uh, debt overhang from the Bashir regime. And look, there are complexities there right now, you know, triple digit inflation, uh, a lot of problems in some uh, areas of Sudan where people are, are protesting. But um, to me, there is a tremendous amount of potential. And I think the big difference between countries with or without potential in Africa is this one has got a significant tailwind of support behind it. It's seen as a pivot state. You've got people working behind the scenes. We've seen the results already of everyone working in a joined up and coherent manner. And therefore, I think, you know, Sudan, as much as the Congo, is another country to watch. A lot of potential. Uh, Agriculture is huge. The Gulf is looking for food security. A lot of land in Sudan, the Nile. Um, and, you know, a sophisticated, uh, reasonably well educated uh, citizenry. We saw that in 2019 when they deposed Bashir. Very articulate. And I said, so I'm really bullish. Um, I think, you know, Dangote was saying he's going to have a look. I think, you know, all of us Africans should have a good look at Khartoum. A lot of potential there. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, Chima, any contributions? Oh, uh, yes. Um, so, I, much like Ali said, uh, I think Sudan is um, a country to really watch out for. We can see it started from when um, they were removed from um, being designated as a terrorist nation or terrorist supporting um, country by the US, which um, you know, had limited foreign investments from being interested or being, you know, safe or secure in that um, environment. So with that, we should, you know, start to see, with that and other reforms that are being put in place as requirements, we should start to see investor confidence return um, to that, con that country. Also, something I see that has really struck me is how um, a lot of international bodies and countries have, you know, um, come to the rescue of Sudan, starting with um, um, members of Paris Club, with France trying to help it bridge its IMF loan, with other countries trying to help it clear, uh, help them clear their um, overhanging debt. And, you know, with a lot of countries or a lot of um, international um, stakeholders trying to help them with many projects, building roads, and you know, building refineries if possible, you know, as they have as they are trying to acquire funds for. So I think it's something that we can watch out for, most especially because a lot of people have come to Sudan's aid and you know a lot of investors should be um, refocusing their energy um, when we start to see results. 
Mm. And we do hope that they will be able to get it right, you know, with some level of decorum at this point in time. Thanks a great deal, Chima. Uh, Bosing, your final comments. I mean, we know that listed companies in Tunisia are beginning to generate higher income at this point in time. Would yeah, you like to... Yes, okay. it's Tunisian, it's Tunisian banks. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the, the overall income up about 1.29 billion dollars in the first quarter. It looks like that's a bit of a shake-off of the 2020 pandemic period, but, but I'm interested also in the United Media Services listing with 20 to 30 percent stake on the EGX by the year 2024. That looks like a long way from now, but so but we can wait, by the way, uh, can't we? Uh, my final point on Sudan is that it's been a very good news so far. The EFDB has also been very supportive uh, of this uh, uh, Sahel uh, economy. I hope and I wish that the global powers would also do the same thing for Zimbabwe. And, and forgive uh, uh, the country some of its debts, perhaps forgive the former president who is late, Robert Mugabe, and I tend to forget uh, so that the sins of Robert Mugabe is not visited on the future generations, the present and future generations of Zimbabwe. So I think this is time to get Zimbabwe back into the, uh, into the global community, as it were, so that the country can also uh, begin to move on. It's been, a, it's been a pariah nation for so long, just like Sudan, I think it is time to welcome them back into the fold as well. Just making a case for Zimbabwe as well. <laughs> Africa <laughs> rising, and we can only rise, actually. Let's leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. Leave no behind. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you, lady and gentlemen, for gracing the show this morning. Chimao Kadeke, our consumer goods analyst with Vetiva Capital Management. Thanks a great deal for your analysis. Ali Kansachu, appreciate your rich analysis always on the program thanks a great deal the chief executive officer of rich management frontiers at nairobi kenya thanks a great deal bosona mofai thanks a great deal for your wonderful analysis and editorial on the show this morning this has been the last edition of our show for may 2021 i'm temple ashaju i'll see you on the other side june the first tomorrow bye for now <laughs>